it's difficult to avoid uh, the use of the word chaos surrounding the United Kingdom's current handling of the Brexit negotiations. And it's worth saying just a few words about what I mean by uh, confusion. There is, of course, and there always is in political life, there are personal ambitions and career interests at work as they would be normally, and there's nothing very unusual or surprising about that. There is, however, also on top of that, what can only be described as a deep ideological divide which, um, which splits this government and this, the ruling Conservative Party, which it's about more than Brexit, but Brexit has brought together many of the themes that underline those deep, deep divisions. I don't think it's too much of an exaggeration to say that it might work out that the divisions in the Conservative Party are as massive and as radical as happened during the Corn Laws in the 19th century. That is to say, the grounds for some major split or major realignment. I don't say that will happen, but there are certainly enough grounds for thinking it could happen. The confusion, of course, is over uh, how to square the circle of negotiating exit from the European Union without adversely affecting Britain's economic, commercial, uh, political, security, and other interests. Uh, many people, and I'm one of them, believe it isn't possible. But that doesn't matter. There, there are people who think it might be possible or should be possible, and that's what they're uh, motivated at present to try and produce in terms of a coherent government position. So far, they've failed to produce it. Um, yesterday, in the House of Commons, I was reading, since I've been here in Dublin, the debate uh, was a classic of this kind, which is the Prime Minister, a much weakened figure. I don't need to rehearse the reasons for her personal weakness. It's been touch and go these last few weeks whether she would survive the month. And I think there's a question mark over her tenure in office, irrespective of the way things go, even between now and the end of the year. But that, that we'll see. Uh, she said in the speech yesterday, uh, the media picked up one of two themes. F first theme, um, we want an agreement, but if we can't get an agreement, we're going to be ready for a hard Brexit. I mean, she didn't quite put it in that language, but that was the, we must begin and we are beginning arrangements that will uh, protect our interests in the unfortunate event that we cannot reach an agreement. Now, that's been implicit for some time, but it's stated explicitly. So you could see a lot of heads nodding, apparently, in the House of Commons when that was said. But on the other hand, in an almost throwaway remark, uh, talking about what would happen in the transitional phase that they are hoping to negotiate uh, prior, uh, post leaving in March 2019, uh, which would ease the transition for a period of years, I'll come back to what a period of years might mean, um, in which more or less they say everything will remain the same. Frankly, you won't notice very much difference, but we will be preparing in a smooth way our eventual exit. In relation to that, she asked about, well, during this transition period, uh, will we be independent of the European Court of Justice or not? She said, oh, no, we, what's the effect, we will remain um, uh, bound by the rulings of the European Court of Justice. She went on to say, at least as far as the existing corpus of law is concerned, she left open whether further laws made in parallel with our membership of the uh, uh, of the tra during the transitional phase would also be obliged, uh, Britain would be obliged to accept. But you can see a goodies thrown one way and something thrown the other way. And this has characterized the government's position all along. Uh, and I remember the last time I was lucky enough to be here um, talking about how this is affecting the government machine as opposed to the political class. And the government machine is now right in the firing line of these internal differences. It's unavoidable. They've been brought to the head most recently by the Prime Minister's, you may think, belated decision to get a better grip on the core issues of Brexit, which have to do with, our, with Britain's future trade relationship with the European Union. There are many other issues, but 
from the, from the government's point of view, that is perhaps the overriding key one. To get a better grip on that, she has sequestered very senior civil servants from the department for managing Brexit uh, to bring them into number 10. And of course, they are trying to recruit from other ministries to give a kind of mini Whitehall to the Prime Minister. This has, by the way, happened before, but it's on a bigger scale now. Because frankly, how do you keep control of negotiations when your minister you know has an agenda, which maybe you can go along with some of the way, but you can't be sure of going along with all of the way. So there is quite a lot of rivenness, conflict, division in the government machine, which is adding to the problem that Brussels has, which is that asked, they, they don't know what the British uh, answers to the problem are. They're not even sure what the British questions are, i.e. what exactly they're after. Not what they will get, but what exactly they're after. Uh, this, I, I, I think everybody knows, is particularly acute in the trade-related sectors where after 40 years of membership, trade expertise largely disappeared from Whitehall. Um, it went to many of, the, many of the most senior trade officials in Brussels are, are British. Uh, and many others have retired. And somebody said to me, oh, a long time ago now, they said, we're in the situation where if the minister calls for a brief, we've got to have a brief on the widget industry, I'll call it. There was nobody that knew anything about the widget industry, had any connection, knew anybody in it. And this has led to this massive, enormous recruitment from consultancies, banks, putting together, at, by the way, at much higher remuneration rates than civil servants, teams to try and advise them on how to handle particular sectors. That's very difficult to do if you've got a lengthy, timely negotiation where you can bed down uh, the whole process. Um, uh, you have time to do so before you reach the crunch point in the negotiations and time is running out. One thing the UK does not have is time. Almost certainly the October decision will be that not enough progress has been made on the first stage of the negotiations to warrant the Commission, Barnier, uh, recommending to the Council that enough progress has been made to warrant going on to the second stage, which are the big chunky issues of what kind of future relationship and what transition might apply. Why? because the th in the three issues, not satisfactory answers have emerged uh, on, uh, firstly, payments due, secondly, uh, on uh, citizens' rights, and thirdly, on the border. Uh, the first two are absolutely, tangibly uh, immature in terms of agreement status. Uh, the British have conceded that they owe some money, and they've even put some kind of a round figure on it, but it's very much <coughs> related to what they would be paying almost in the transition anyway. Uh, what they haven't yet conceded is all the long-term commitments that over the years the UK has made, along with all the other member states, in committing long-term development funding, both through the common EU policy network, uh, framework, but also through the European Investment Bank, and EU funding for development projects done by the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. All of those add up to a much more substantial figure. We appear to be nowhere near an agreement on this yet. The UK kind of now recognizes uh, what they call a moral obligation, not a really an legal obligation, a moral obligation to honor these debts, but does not want to debate about figures because figures will toxify an already super toxic uh, debate and uh, dissension and strife inside the ruling Conservative Party. So what do they, might they settle for? They might settle for a formula which would give certain principles which somebody, most people numerate, could work out eventually how it would convert over a period of time into figures. So it's possible, that hasn't happened yet, so there's no basis, as far as I can see, for the Commission to say, we can move straight on to the second stage negotiation. That's got to be done before December, December the end of 2017. The second thing is on uh, citizens' rights. More progress has been made there. There's a fair 
amount of areas where there's a consensus, but there are some very tricky issues, again, relating to the court, relating to reunification of families, and, and some other issues uh, uh, to do with retirement people who move from one EU country to another, who might fall into this category of EU residents in the UK and also UK residents in the European Union. On Ireland, I'm afraid I've got nothing to say. I have no idea what they think, what they want, what they're going to get. Not a clue. Um, the, they do have one argument, however, don't underestimate the influence it can have. They can say, we accept the exceptional situation of Northern Ireland. We accept fully the commitment to the Good Friday Agreement. We accept fully the whole prior commitment to the peace process. But giving an answer, I can't even ask, I can't even tell you what we would like as a substitute to border controls until I know what you will offer us in terms of the nature of the future trade agreement, and agreement vis-a-vis -vis access to the single market and participation, if not membership of the customs union. So there, there it's, a, it's a kind of dance around the spectre of the north and the border and all of that. Um, and, but they are, they are saying there, well, it's up to you. If you move to the second stage, we will be clearer about what we could do, right? Uh, so that's where we're at, it seems to me, uh, and we're now looking at December. December, in theory, gives 15 months before Britain leaves in March 2019, if, if assuming that December there is enough agreement to move to the second stage. Uh, but um, that's not 15 months, although it might look like 15 months, because six months has to be reserved for the approval of any treaty. So in reality, if the second stage negotiations begin, say, in January, assuming there is this agreement in December, which is quite a big assumption, but let's assume there is, then there is about um, seven months, eight months if you stretch it, to negotiate everything about the second stage, which are much bigger and far more complicated issues to do with access to relationship with the single market, the currency union, and a myriad of issues to do with health and safety, matters that relate to the free movement of trade in many, in many sectors. So can it be done, assuming we get to that stage? I find Personally, my personal opinion is I find great difficulty in imagining that that is going to be possible. I think had there been a quick and rapid agreement to the first stage, and there was something like a year and a half, you would be a bit more sanguine about being able to complete the second stage without any delays. Uh, but I think um, there may have to be some delays. I've always thought that... Um, at some point, the British government itself might ask for some extension of the Article 50 timetable to provide a more realistic framework for completing the second stage of departure. But um, that is terribly complicated. It would have to be approved by all 28 plus the parliament, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. One rumor I hear is an old, people here from Brussels in the old days will have heard famous phrase, stop the clock. There might be a stop the clock um, temptation, a bit like that. Uh, it's happened before in sectoral, complicated council negotiations, fishing, I remember, agriculture, probably some others if I put my mind to it, where they, did, they have stopped the clock and they pretended that time doesn't move and sometimes it's only a matter of days, sometimes it's a matter of weeks and it's been many <clears> months in some cases. Not, it, not to be ruled out. Is it going to happen? I haven't a clue. But those are the possibilities. Assuming th that uh, the impossible can be done in this time, or the very, very difficult can be done, then all the attention then focuses to the transitional phase. Firstly, how long? The formal government position is, was, two years. Note, it's changed in the last few weeks to about two years. Well, so what is about two years? I'm inclined to say again, search me, but it's more than two years. The Chancellor 
Philip Hammond, who is held by his party to represent the spearhead of the soft Brexit approach, uh, has talked about two or three years. Um, other people have talked and speculated about a longer transition, maybe even a, a, a transition that is sectorally specific, i.e. different time periods for different sectors. Uh, I see John Bruton speculated in the papers uh, about six years, and I've heard similar figures talked about, but there's no indication as to what the government's real fallback, this is uh, ultra secret, this is as secret as the, the wartime um, spy center, the, the intelligence center, uh, 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 when the Churchill got all the advanced uh, intelligence of the Wehrmacht in, in its military deployment, and the, he, he couldn't do too much because it would reveal that they had the secret. I, I mean, there is something comparable now about the, 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 nature, of the, the nature of the transition. Um, so coming on then to the, the questions about, well, what kind of a deal might one imagine if it got to that stage, the more access to the kind of rights that members have that a non-member might be given, that principle, <laughs> is obviously related to acceptance of the conditionalities and the disciplines and the obligations that apply to members. So it's a two-way bargain. It goes luffery like this. If we were to concede that you would have significant access, comparable, the, 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 the government's position is identical as far as possible in terms of the benefits that we have from the single market, from the customs union, etc. The, the more that is the case, the greater have to be the matching uh, obligations that go with that kind of quasi-membership status. Free movement is obviously has been foremost among them. That has been, that's been a, a, an absolutely toxic issue in the whole British debate. It uh, undoubtedly was deliberately used to poison the debate by the Brexit side uh, and uh, all kinds of, you know about the phony promises of hundreds of millions of pounds a week going to the NHS once we stop our budget payments and all that kind of talk. But it's become now um, a much more problematic question in a way that the government might not have anticipated. There is a problem now with EU workers in Britain and that is that they're leaving and they're leaving in very significant numbers, and understandably. And that is why there is a serious personnel crisis, shortage of people emerging in the health service, emerging in agriculture, by the way, uh, especially in the East Coast, where Brexit has been quite strong, uh, and in uh, other areas of science, universities, research, so the, the problem isn't emigration, but immigration. It is not immigration, but it's a, 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 immigration, if you will, or people, people leaving. If I had to speculate, and I, I'm saying all of this with a heavy health warning, might there be some way uh, to ease this? Firstly, they are now talking about high levels of continued migration. They're not pretending tens of thousands, down to tens of thousands, that's all gone. That's for the birds, all disappeared. Now they're talking, and when they talk to particular sectors, the car industry, agriculture, the health service, they say, oh, there won't be any change. You'll have as many people as you want. We'll see that the rules and regulations. So there's a kind of retreat from the tangibility of ending free movement. There's a retreat from it already very much underway. And the skeptic, hardline skeptics, the most ideological skeptics on the far right, are picking this up in a big way. Uh, so they, they, are, they are beginning uh, to dilute what they meant by ending free movement or managing migration. There are some other things that are also happening which could affect this discussion. One of the problem areas, it's not a very important one, but it has been a problem area, has been the abuse of the Posted Workers Directive, which, um, under which companies in, uh, say, Central and Eastern Europe can send people to work in the UK uh, 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 and, in effect, have disregarded agreed labor standards, pay rates, 
workers' rights, etc. There is now a proposal, not from the British, a proposal from the Commission. Uh, the President has, the Commission has talk, talked openly about it, of a major reform, and it's driven by the Swedes, Danes, Germans, in particular the French, mm -hmm to amend the posted workers directive so that that becomes much, much more difficult and can be cracked down on. That could be another element. I'm just citing bits of the trifle that might go into the pudding, as it were. Uh, and thirdly, um, there is now, I think, as part of a, a new current of discussion in the European Union about reform of the European Union. This has come up in a number of contexts one of great importance to all member states and finance ministers, but it's a bit of a double-edged sword for Ireland, is the crackdown on major corporate tax avoidance. The, I think, fairy tale system uh, under which uh, the giant uh, global corporations have their tax assessed on what's called turnover, uh, uh, on profits rather than on, on turnover, which allows quite ludicrously small sums to be paid. That's happening with the new Vestager uh, proposals. There is also the new proposal uh, for a euro area uh, social pillar, a strengthening of the existing social pillar applicable to the euro area countries, open to the non-euro area EU countries if they wish to join it. So what I'm describing here are various elements that could emerge in the eventual um, uh, pudding that emerges to be decided on uh, in talks uh, and during the second stage. Has that solved the free movement problem? No. Is it still the bogey that is most difficult to confront and tackle? Yes. Is it losing some of its electoral potency? Yes. Mm -hmm. The, the evidence from the recent general election and from other polling evidence is that the, the, the support for um, hardline Brexitary is diminishing. It's, it's declining. Not, you mustn't exaggerate it. And people who are defected from the Labour Party, for example, uh, are because of uh, uh, leave sympathies, that vote is refluxing back. And by the way, quite a big way. So it doesn't mean they suddenly become terribly europhilic. It means that they are much more uh, worried about other things. There are many other challenges, issues that face them, face people economically, social inequality question. Uh, all of those issues, which are at the heart of the British debate, are overarching some of these earlier uh, divisions and debates on the Brexit. So one, one important thing I want to say about the, uh, about the nature of the transition agreement is this. There is now a new constitutional setup for the electoral law in Britain, a five-year term parliament. The five-year term of this government ends in spring of 2022. So that's the furthest that the government could go. This is not to say they'll get anything like that way, given what's going on, but it, it is the constitutional limit. The more, if there is any delay to the start of the transitional phase, as a result of the need for more time to negotiate the second phase of these negotiations, uh, uh, um, uh, or if the transition phase is extended in the way it looks as though it may well be, then it passes 2022. And that's a big political point. That means the actual moment of truth occurs after this government has left office and when this government may well not be re-elected and there may be a new government. Now, I don't want to invent reasons for thinking the world changes uh, overnight, but the political context in which the debates are taking place, it seems to me, will change. Uh, let me say a word about the Labour opposition because it's caused a lot of questions to be raised. Um, I can't say a huge amount, but I, I'd say this from having talked to uh, people in the Corbyn leadership and uh, in particular Keir Starmer, who is the shadow minister for negotiations. Um, 
at one level, they would agree, I think, with a large part of the analysis I've given. But another part of them says, well, we've got to think about the electoral arithmetic. There are still a lot of older Labour MPs that are worried about the Leave vote in their constituencies, which inhibits how far we can move publicly to a breach with the government's negotiating objectives. So the present formal stance is to creep ahead by a few centimeters of the government's position. They argued for, when it wasn't clear they would um, have any kind of uh, transitional phase that kept the present arrangements in place, they said they should be there. And then the government accepted, well, maybe they should be there. And then they said, well, we're not going to put a time limit on this. It depends on circumstances. Jeremy Corbyn has said himself, he's pointed out, I have put no time limit on how, these trans how long these transitional measures last. Now, you may say, and I certainly have said, it's not the bravest of positions, but it seems to me it reflects what is actually happening on the ground, that as the centre of British attention focuses to a range of other issues, as well as Brexit, and the government positions weakens, they can be in a stronger position to remain, remain ahead of where the government is without being so far ahead that they risk uh, May turning uh, tails on them and inc inciting uh, divisions in their own ranks about how far they should go to recognize the inevitability of a protracted relationship with the European Union. The last thing I want to say, really, at this, I'm obviously happy to field any questions that you've got, is something I don't think enough attention has been given to, which is that I've referred to some of the changes that are occurring at the European Union level, or not changes that are occurring, changes that are being talked about, let's be clear important changes to, which move in the direction of the euro area becoming the core of the process of European integration. It's not a new idea, but it's, it's coming back again in quite a, a significant way. And it's interesting that the euro area is appearing as the, as the body which would undertake some new steps in integration, quite apart from the ones that relate to economic and monetary union, which is naturally their business anyway, like the European Labour Authority that is now being talked about, like uh, various other measures that are designed to strengthen uh, uh, the social, environmental governance of, of the European Union. None of this has yet materialised in a final agreement, but um, I think a speech made by Macron a few weeks ago, I think it was in Marseille, in which he talked about this, he said, what we're really talking about is uh, looking again at a Europe of concentric circles. And he talked about, at one point, he actually said, I haven't got the precise words in front of me, but he said, you know, there could be, um, there could be the euro area, there could be the immediate circle around it of EU countries that are not yet in the euro area. There might be a third circle of countries that could be brought much closer to the European Union, the way he put it. I think what he has in mind might be a resting place for countries in the Balkans, maybe in the neighborhood, the so-called neighborhood agreement countries, or some of them. I don't know that anybody's thought it through in detail, where there might be a more structured, uh, institutionalized relationship. And he said, who knows, maybe that will be a place where our British friends would be most comfortable, and maybe uh, uh, that will be something that emerges. So I think that the Brexit issue becomes, the longer we go on, intimately linked with the process, internal process in the European Union itself of its future evolution. All of these things add more unknowns to the equation. I'm aware I'm not ending with a conclusion that says, therefore, one, two, three, four, but uh, uh, perhaps a wider range of options than has hitherto been considered. I think that British public opinion is at a turning point. I think it's shown that in the recent elections, which have been about other issues, but nonetheless it's important. I think there is less gung-ho zealotry for Brexit than there was, but the poison, if you like, has gone very deep into the present government, 
and it's difficult to know how long it can survive as a coherent government, whether a premature election or an earlier than, previs than foreseen election might occur, but one will probably, well, one will certainly have to occur probably before the transitional period itself is over, which raises all other kinds of speculation.